Well, welcome. In this video, we're going to be looking at what's called cumulative distributions. Just like it sounds, it's going to be looking at another way that we can um, look at the distribution of data. Basically, it's taking what we've seen before with a regular bar graph, where we're comparing a uh, categorical variable with a numerical variable. And instead of looking at it as individual parts, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at how it would look um, cumulatively over time. Um, so you'll see more what I mean by that as we look at some examples. But technically, let's look here at what the definition of a cumulative uh, distribution would be. It says it's going to be a function whose values are cumulative frequencies or cumulative relative frequencies. So there's a couple ways that we could have a cumulative distribution. So let's start by just jumping into an example so you can see more what I'm talking about by a situation that's cumulating over time. So let's go ahead and look at that. So here it says a table at the right and graph below show the normal precipitation in Los Angeles, California. The second column of the table shows a total or cumulative precipitation for the year um, up to including the month. The graph is complete but some values in the table are missing. So we're going to fill out that table but first let's look at the situation here. So here in this graph Again, you can see it's a properly made graph because it has a nice title. It says precipitation for the Los Angeles by month. And we can see the months along the x-axis there with the monthly precipitation on the y-axis. So we can easily read that to see that in February, you can see that Los Angeles receives a little over two inches of precipitation, where in June, July, and August, they receive uh, very little, if any, precipitation during those three months. Now, on the table to the right, they give the exact values. Now, let's look at that table. So, the first column is referring to the information that's graphed in our, in our bar graph here. Uh, the column on the right is what we call the cumulative precipitation. So, through January, there's accumulation of 2.4 inches. Now, to figure out the accumulation through February, we would add February's total precipitation, and that would give us our cumulative precipitation through the month of February. And then to figure out the cumulative precipitation through March, we would take that 4.91, add it to the 1.98, and it gives us a 6.89, and so on. So when we need to finish the table, I would take 7.75 here, add that to June's precipitation, which is only 0 0.03, so three hundredths of an inch. Add those together, and we get 7.78 inches. If I wanted to figure out the November total to figure out the how they got that total precipitation through the month of November of 10.35, I would take 10.35, subtract that from the previous total, 8.59, and that's going to tell me how much I increased by, and I increased by 1.76 inches. So that means this total would be 1.76. So that is how we would complete the table. That's what we have to do in part A here. Part B says draw a bar graph of the cumulative precipitation by month. Okay, so let's do that. First, we're going to need a couple of axes here. So I'm going to just draw this out. Along the bottom, instead of having uh, to write all the names of the months, I'm going to abbreviate these by first letter. So I'm going to make these of equal length. So I'm going to need 12. Okay, so that should give me my whole year there. So again, each of those represent the first letter of the individual months. Now that I have that set up, the next step is to figure out, well, what should my y-axis be? Uh, my y-axis is going to be the cumulative precipitation in inches. And if you notice, my highest total is a little bit over 12 inches. So I want to make sure that I have enough spots to include that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to count my twos. So it'll be two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. I'm going to go a little higher, so I'm going to go up to fourteen. Okay. So then I can create my table. So along the bottom here, I want to make sure that I include my labels. We're going to call this uh, month, and this would be the 
cumulative precipitation in inches. And so now let's create our bars. So we're going to refer to this uh, column on the right. So the first column is 2.4 inches. The first spot is 2.4 inches. And then after that, um, you can look in your own sheet. Instead of going up and down, it's going to get you dizzy here. But after that, our accumulation was 4.91, which is just under 5. So estimate where that would be. And then we'd go up to 6.89, which is just shy of 7. Again, we're just doing our best with the, history, with the bars here, trying to make them as close as possible. So 7.61. And then 7.75, 7.78, 7.79. So you can see here that it's not really increasing much for right now. 7.94, getting closer to 8. And then we're up to a little bit past 8. Now we're getting up there. Now we're getting up to 8.59. Let me jump up to 10.35. And then we're up to just a little over 12. So that is what our cumulative bar graph would look like. And then it says, when has half the yearly precipitation fallen? Well, we had a total of 12 inches. Half of that would be 6 inches. So you can see that that occurred because through February, there was just under 5 inches. By the end of March, there's a total of 6.89 inches. So the month where half the yearly precipitation had fallen was during the month of March. And when has 3 fourths of the rain fallen? Well, 3 fourths of 12 would be 9 inches. So well, that's not what they're asking for. So we would just look at our cumulative. You can look at the bar graph or you can look at our data and see that 9 inches would have occurred during the month of November. Because before that, it wasn't quite 9 inches, but because through October, it had been 8.59 inches. But during November, we got more rain. So by the end of November, it reached 10.35. So your answer here would be November. And one thing I just realized is our graph miss is missing something very important. As I'm writing all this information here, I see that I'm missing a title, so I'm going to put that over here to the right. So just make sure that you include all these uh, pieces. This will be the cumulative precipitation in LA would be fine for a title. So we're actually going to skip this next example, and we're going to go down here to the second example, example 2A. Because in the previous example, we were, we were looking at a bar graph, and there's going to be times where maybe a line graph would be a better uh, kind of graph to use. And situations like that would be graphs involving time, because time is continuous, and so it'd be a great opportunity to use, like I said, a line graph. And there'll be reasons why when we get to analyze the information, and you'll get, we'll get to that as we get to part C and D here for this question. Okay, well, the first thing we get, need to do is we need to complete this table. This is dealing with a, at 5 a.m., a sudden snowstorm caused Oak School to cancel classes. With no automated message relay system, news had to spread word of mouth. The table shows how many of the 170 families knew about the closing from 5 a.m. to 8 a.m. Okay, so from 5 a.m. to 5.30, during that segment, there was uh, six people that were notified. And so at that point, the accumulation, so that's the last column here, would be also 6. And then we know at, by the end of 6 a.m., now 14 people know about it. Well, we've got to figure out, well, how many people would that be? Well, 14 minus 6 is 8. So we know that there would be 8 people that found out by that time. Now, by 6.30, 48 people knew about the cancellation. So if I subtract 48 and 14, 48 minus 14 is 34. So by that point, 34 more people were notified. And then we have it all set up for 7 a.m. But by 7.30, 168 out of the 170 people knew about it. So at 7, 152 people knew about it. So going from 152 to 168 means that there were 16 more people that were notified. 
and we have the rest of the table filled out then because then uh, at 8 a.m. the last two people were notified so now we're up to 170. So now we're going to create our bar graph down below. Now if you notice they've already set up the bar graph for us I'm sorry, the line graph for us as far as the axes are concerned. They said that along the bottom here, this is um, the times given in half hours, so five half hour increments, so from 5.30 to 6, and then 6.37, and so on. Along the y-axis, that represents the number of people, number of families that have been notified. So starting at 5.30, we have six families that were notified. Now we're going to estimate, because 10 would be halfway, uh, so that means... 5 would be a quarter of the way up, and so we're working with 6, which is pretty close to 5. So I'll estimate that to be about there. By 6 a.m., 14 families knew about it. So 14 would be about 3 quarters of the way up, between 0 and 20. By 6.30, 48 families knew, so that's about halfway between 40 and 60. And then by 7 a.m., 152 families knew about it. So 150 is halfway between 140 and 160. And 168 at 730. Well, here's 160, so 168 would be just under halfway. And then at 8 a.m. is when we had all 170 families notified, which is halfway between 160 and 180. So now we're going to connect these with, a, with lines. We want to do straight lines between the points. There we go. So there's your line graph representing the total number notified of the school closing. So now let's answer part C. It says, when had half the families been notified? Well, half of 170 is 85. So that was going to be, so we've got to figure out, well, at what point did 85 families know about it? So I'll look over here at my graph. Here's 80. So 90 is halfway. 85 would be about a quarter of the way. So here's 6.30, 6.45 would be halfway between 6.30 and 7. So it's just shy of 6.45. So I'm just going to say 6.40 a.m. That's when about half the families have been notified. Now the next question says, when had three quarters of the family been notified? Well, three quarters is going to be three fourths of our total, which is 170. And if you multiply these together, you end up getting an answer of 127.5. So I'm going to estimate where 127.5 would be. So here's 120. 130 would be halfway. So again, 127 would be just under half. So if this is 645 and this is 7, I'm going to estimate it to be about 650 a.m. Okay, somewhere in there. Again, these are estimations, so when you're, when you're doing this on your own, um, you would just have to be pretty close. If you're off by five minutes or so, it's not going to be a huge deal. Um, but you wouldn't say 7. It's not going to be, be 7. It would be somewhere between 6.45 and 7 a.m. Now, there's one last thing I forgot to type into here, but let's make sure we talk about this because there's questions in your assignments based on percentiles. And a percentile is this. It's the pth percentile is a value where p percent of the numbers are less than or equal to that value. For example, I have children, and we bring those children into their checkups, and they weigh them. They see how tall they are, and they compare their weight and their height to other children their same age. And so if a baby's weight is in the 70th percentile, what that means is that 70% of the babies are less than or equal to that baby's weight. So how does that work in a problem you might see in your assignment? Well, let's look at one from your assignment. Let's look at number two here. It says a teacher gave a quiz which had a maximum score of 20 points. The chart below gives each score X and its frequency F. So let's make sure we know how to read this. So again, there's 20 points total. So that means there was one student that got 7 out of 20. Not such a good score. There were 16 students that got a score of 16, and there was one student that got a score of 20. So that's how we would look at each of those pieces of information. So when it says how many students took the quiz, that's going to refer to the total frequency. So we can add these numbers together. If I take 1 plus 1 plus 2 plus 1 and so on, 
if I add all these together, I'm going to get my total number of students, which is going to end up being a total of 50 students. When it says, how many students have scores less than or equal to the score at the 92nd percentile? And what score is that? So how many students have scores less than or equal to the score at the 92nd percentile? Well, the first step is to figure out, well, where would the how many students represent 92%? So we're going to take 92% or 0.92 times the total number of students, which is 50. And when you do that, you get 46. So that means 92% of the students got, so 92% of the students represent 46 out of the 50 students. And so now we've got to figure out, well, what score represents what those 46 students and less got. So to figure that out, we're going to look at this data. And again, we're going to start from the left, and we're going to add up until I get to 46. So 1 plus 1 is 2, plus another 2 is 4, plus 1 is 5, plus 3 is 8, 8 plus 9 is 17, 17 plus 16 is 33, 33 plus 9 is 42, 42 plus 4 is 46. So I get to my 46th student um, at a score of 18. So in other words, 92% of the students got at least an 18 on the quiz. Or you could say 92% of the students got a score of 18 or less on the quiz. So again, our answer would be 46 for the first part. And what score would that be? That would be a score of 18. So that's how you're going to do these problems when you see situations dealing with percentiles. So I just wanted to make sure that I refer to that. So with that, that is the end of our lesson. So good luck now on your assignment.